Let's get started then. So we've already opened in prayer. So if anyone has a question, fire away. That is a really great question. Anyone have something? I got one. Okay, Lee, you're up. Uh, there's a book that talks about the four different kinds of forgiveness. What would we say about that? I've not read the book. Uh, I'm not sure there's four different kinds of forgiveness. Um, what I will show you is, I'll show you a couple things that you need to understand about forgiveness. So the first thing is, look with me at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Oftentimes the Bible will, will tell you how to think about a subject, of course, but it'll also tell you how to even think about what words mean. So look with me at Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The reason why that verse is so helpful is when you think about the subject of forgiveness, there's a lot of cliches that people use. There's a lot of things they say. So, for example, one, one thing that's often reported or often said is, you can't forgive someone unless they ask to be forgiven. I don't know if you ever heard that one or not. That's something that people sometimes say. If you think about forgiveness from the concept of releasing a debt, I think that is the most scriptural and helpful way to think about the subject. Let me give you another example. People sometimes say, I'll forgive it, but I won't forget it. And the idea there is, well, okay, I'll forgive it because I know it's the Christian thing to do, but I'm still mad. Right? That's what women say. <laughs> it, 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 it's a saying, right? Well, if you think about it as the release of a debt, so think of it as, you know, there's a debt on the books that is owed to you and you decide to release it. You're kind of done with it in, in the sense that you're not trying to collect it. You're not trying to, you're not trying to collect on it. You're not trying to, to make it do. With forgiveness, it is not dependent upon the wrongdoer asking for forgiveness. The reason why that matters is this. When people wrong you, does everyone who wrongs you come and seek forgiveness? They don't. Sometimes they wrong you and they're happy about it, right? They're not repentant. Well, if, if your forgiving them was dependent upon them asking your forgiveness, you would never be able to forgive them. The reason you need to forgive someone, the, the, the first reason, is not simply for their benefit, it's for your own benefit, so that you don't just stew on and, and rehearse and repeat the injury again and again and again. I'll give you an example that that I knew of. <clears throat> this is especially important in family situations where what happens is there will be grievances and people will remember them for a long time. And I had one relative who was mad at her younger sister 
because when it was the younger sister's turn to wash the bathtub, she didn't do it. And this was being told to me by someone that was in their 80s. So in other words, her sister, 65 years ago or however long, right, long enough that the statute of limitations for any crime other than murder had elapsed, right? She's mad because her younger sister didn't wash the bathtub. Well, does the younger sister even remember not washing the bathtub? Probably not. So who is really harmed in this instance? It's the person that can't let go of the hurt, uh, of the injury from the wrongdoing. Well, what, what should you do? What you should do as, as the person who has been wronged is, is you forgive the debt, you forgive the wrongdoing to, to conclude it in your own life so that you're not continually rehashing it and suffering the emotional injury again and again and again and again. You follow me on that? So I think it's helpful to think about forgiveness from the standpoint of forgiveness is the decision not to collect a debt. And so if you think of it as a debt that's on your books, you have 100% control over it, right? It's not someone else's to determine. You control how to deal with it, and you can just decide, I'm done with this. And, and that's typically the healthiest thing to do. Now, we're in Matthew 6, so I want to make a, a one or two more points on forgiveness that are often overlooked. So when we read verse 12... We're, of course, reading from the Lord's Prayer. So look at verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So this is the Lord's Prayer. And this is very likely the most commonly prayed prayer in all of Christendom, right? Almost everyone knows it. It's commonly prayed. Well, just notice what it says. So look at verse 10. Thy kingdom come. What's this prayer about? Well, it's about a kingdom coming. So if you just think about this for a minute, if you're in Matthew 6, so you're, you're right here, right before the cross, and, you know, probably the best way to do this is <clears throat> let's uh, hide the dispensation of grace just for a minute. In Matthew 6, was there any knowledge of the existence of the dispensation of grace? Yeah. None. So the dispensational chart looked exactly like this. There was no dispensation of grace. So if you put yourself in Matthew 6, so we're going to be right after, whoops, right after John the Baptist, right there. And the Lord teaches the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come. <clears throat> what is the Lord talking about? The earthly kingdom. And, and what is the event on the chart where the kingdom does come? What event is that? Second coming, Second coming right? So as we think about what's going on here, if you're, if you're right here, right after John the Baptist, and you're praying, thy kingdom come, it's talking about the second coming. And the second coming was going to be fulfilled within the life of the hearers, right? This generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. So in Matthew 6, just so you notice this, the Lord's Prayer is very dispensational in the sense that it's all about the second coming. That's what they were looking towards. I realize that today the Lord's Prayer is, I believe, the most popular prayer in Christendom. But frankly, it's not about the dispensation of grace, is it? Would, should you pray today, Lord, please send the kingdom and return at the second coming. It's not going to happen. All right, so then verse 12, notice what it says. <clears throat> well, let's just read, let's read verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now, when you read verse 11 there and it says, give us this day our daily bread, what Pauline verse does that make you think of? If any man shall not work, let him not eat. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now does 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and Matthew 6 say the same thing? See, in Matthew 6, when it says, give us this day our daily bread, why does that verse say that? The tribulation period and them going without food. Right. If you think about the 70th week, so when, when this prayer is being prayed, during the Lord's earthly ministry, and, and so that's within three years of the cross. Immediately after the cross, when you're in Acts 2, Peter says, this is that which was spoken by whom? Prophet the prophet Joel. And the prophet Joel is about the last days. During the last days, is God going to miraculously provide for Israel? He is. So the point is, when you read the Lord's Prayer, as you go through it line by line, it, it just obviously doesn't have a thing to do with the body of Christ. So now when we look at verse 12, when it says, let's just read it together. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What verse 12 is communicating is that under the kingdom program, to obtain forgiveness, you must first forgive others. And if you do not first forgive others, under the kingdom program, you yourself do not receive forgiveness from God. Now, is that a correct statement or is that false? That's correct. Look at verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Verses 14 and 15, if there was any doubt about what verse 12 means, verse 14 and 15 explained it, right? Under the kingdom program, if you want to obtain forgiveness, what must you first do? You have to forgive your brother that has trespassed against you. Now, think about that teaching on forgiveness. Look with me at Ephesians 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now does Ephesians 4, 2, 4, 32, does it say the same thing as Matthew 6, verse 12, and Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. So in Matthew 6, the first step is you have to forgive others, and then you get forgiveness, right? If ye forgive men their trespasses, then will your heavenly Father forgive you. You have to forgive first in Matthew 6. In Ephesians 4... You forgive others even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So which comes first in Ephesians 4? God forgives you first, and then you forgive others on the basis of the forgiveness you have already received. Now you can gloss over those verses. You can say, well, they talk about forgiveness, and so they're the same thing. They're kind of the reverse, right? The order is, is completely different in the, in the two different passages. What I would encourage you to, to, to understand about the dispensation of grace, get with me Colossians 2. What you will sometimes hear people say is they will say that forgiveness works according to a short account's System, meaning that the way I maintain my relationship with God is when I sin against God, that fellowship is broken. And so I have to confess that sin to restore fellowship. And they call it short accounts because what do I need to do? I need to confess my sin continually because as I sin, fellowship is broken, so I have to confess it. And then I'm pretty good for about 12 seconds. <laughs> And then I sin again, I got to confess it, and three minutes later I'm doing the same thing. Well, the idea there of the, of the short account system is that your relationship with God, or really your fellowship with God, it, it, it's continually interrupted by, by when you sin. And so you have to confess it to restore it. Look with me at Colossians 2.13. 
Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, notice the next part, having forgiven you all trespasses. When you believe the gospel today, in the instant that you believe the gospel, you are forgiven of all trespasses, past, present, future. So they're all dealt with, they're all resolved at that time. Are you under a short account system where you have to continually confess sin in order to restore your fellowship with God? No. Now that doesn't mean that I'm encouraging sin, I'm not saying that. But let me put it this way. How many times can you receive total forgiveness? Once, once because once you receive it, you have total forgiveness, right? You, you can't receive total forgiveness more than one time. So just rejoice in the fact that in the dispensation of grace, the way that forgiveness works is that you obtain complete forgiveness the moment you believe the gospel, all your sins, past, present, future are forgiven. You are declared righteous before God. And then what we should do is we should forgive our fellow man because we've already been forgiven. And if you think about that just for a minute, even if you have someone really obnoxious in your life, have they sinned against you more than you've sinned against God? I mean, how many times have you sinned against God, right? That, that's why the Lord created exponents, right? Because the number of sins you've sinned against God is not a small number. Well, if Christ forgave all those, can we forgive our fellow man? Yes, we can and we should. So th those are the, the things that, you know, in thinking about forgiveness, those are the, the concepts that I would encourage you to think about. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. So the question is, um, since we're supposed to forgive our fellow man, shouldn't we essentially be, be turning the other cheek and, and sort of submitting to any, any injury that someone wants to do to us? Um, the, the thing I would, I would say about that is that uh, if, if you apply that in that sense, during the dispensation of grace, then if someone comes up to you and they, you know, say, you know, hello, do I have your permission to murder you? And you say, well, gee, that would be inconvenient because I have plans for tomorrow, but I don't want to interfere with your free will, so, you know, have at it. Uh, I, I just think that's, it, you know, it's taking the, the, the teaching from the, the kingdom and, and turn the other cheek. Uh, and it's, it's applying it in a way where uh, you, you would reach some absurd conclusions, right? So that would be my, you know, observation about that. Well, my Let's look at the, the passage you're talking about. So you're, you're talking about the parable of the thief in the night, right? Yeah. So let's look at that parable. And um, this will be good because <clears throat> look at Luke 12, 39. 
So one of the parables that we, uh, well, let's look at this and then I'll comment. I'll, I'll make the further comment. So if you look at verse 35, so we're in Luke 12 and we're looking at verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So the context of what we're looking at in Luke 12 is the idea of being watchful and being ready. So in other words, the servants don't know when the master is going to return. So they're vigilant, they're prepared, they're alert, they're attentive so that when he returns, they're ready. So now look at verse 39, which I think is the verse you're referencing. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Verse 40, be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So what that verse is obviously referring to is the second coming, right? And it's referring to the second coming under the, under the prophetic program. And so it's talking, you know, specifically about this event right here. Now, I, I, wanna, I want you to think through something with me. Can believing Israel know the year of the second coming? What do you think the answer is to that question? No man know the day or the hour. So the quote from the audience is that no man knoweth the day or the hour. And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you as a, as a suggested study for the week. If you look very carefully at all of the verses regarding the second coming, what it says is that no one knows the day or the hour. Now you can take that generically and say, well, what that means is no one has any idea when the second coming is going to happen. But think with me just for a moment. How long is the 70th week? Seven years. How long is the first half of the 70th week? Three and a half years. And in fact, when you look at Revelation and you look at the cross references, it'll tell you it's 42 months, right? It'll say exactly that. And, and one of the cross references will tell you it's 1260 days. So what I'm going to suggest to you is this. When verses like Luke 12:39. There's a bunch of verses in Matthew 24 talk about not knowing the day or the hour. I would take those literally, meaning that no one can know the day or the hour. Can they know the year? They can know the year because if you think about Daniel 9, when the man of sin signs the covenant, the second coming is how many years later? Seven, right? Now, it may be plus or minus a couple days, Right? But is it going to be seven years later? Yes. Right? And in the midst of that time period, in the midst of that seven year time period, the Antichrist, uh, the beast, the man of sin, causes the oblation to cease. So the, the point being, what those, what those verses are about, I would suggest to you, is they're about the fact that it will not be possible to know the precise timing of the second coming, but are you going to know the year when it sh should happen? And the answer is you should. Now that's very different from the rapture, isn't it? Do you have any idea what year the rapture is? There's, not, there's zero indication of that. So the idea of those verses, uh, and by the way, the, the idea of those verses, uh, so let, let's just read this. So verse 39 
And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also. So it's taking verse 39 and saying this metaphor in verse 39, I'm going to apply in verse 40. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So let me ask you this question. In verse 40, when you read about the Son of Man, what does the Son of Man correspond to in verse 39? The thief, right? Now here's why this matters. With any parable, with any simile, you need to be very thoughtful and, and, and understanding as to what it's telling you. In other words, what it's saying in this passage is that the second coming of Christ is as unpredictable as the timing of a thief. But it's not saying that the Son of Man himself is a thief. Do you follow what I'm saying there? So what happens sometimes is people read parables, and what they want to do is they want to take each part of the story, and they want to say each part of the story corresponds to this item in reality. You can't do that. If, if you do that, then what happens in this passage? You make the Son of Man, which is obviously a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, you make him a thief, and he is, obviously he's without sin, right? He's not a thief in any sort of meaningful sense. He's a thief in the sense that his second coming is unexpected. You follow me? So the, just a, a word of encouragement there that when you're, when you're reading parables, when you're reading similes, similitudes in the scriptures, you, you have to be attentive to understand what aspect of it it is likening to the thing it's comparing. It's not typically all aspects. Good question. It's also <clears throat> kind of misleading to me that the, the good in the house is in the suck. He was, he's locked down, like he's keeping the, the thief from coming in, the Lord from coming in. But actually, that's more a case of him. If he had known when he was coming, he would not have had it locked and opened the doors for him, as opposed to trying to keep him locked out. Well, the, see, the thing in... Trying to keep the Lord locked out, but really it's readiness to have him, have him not locked, maybe. Well, the, the thing, when you, when you think of the Lord's coming as a thief in the night, it's not, the issue with the unpredictability of the coming of the thief in the night, it's not the unpredictability that thieves come at night, that is well known. Men love darkness because their deeds were evil. Why do people rob things at, at night? Because it's harder to see. The issue with the coming of the thief of the night is they don't tell you when in the night. If thieves always arrived at 3.03 a.m., wouldn't that be convenient, right? In other words, you say, oh, it's set an alarm. You know, you wake up, confirm there's no thief, and go back to sleep. But sometimes they come at 3.03, and sometimes they come at 4.15, and other times they come at, you know, 1.19, right? So the, th that's what I take to be the, the sense of, of what's going on in that passage. Yes, sir. You started off this. question is, and, and if I'm, uh, is there a believing Israel today? There are individual members of Israel. In other words, there are individual people from the Jewish nation that believe, right? An individual today who believes the gospel is there any difference between a believing Jew and a believing Gentile? Not in, the gospel, not in the dispensation of grace. Not in the dispensation of grace, right? Yes, there is. How so? Because 
Paul said that they have to come the same way we come. And they're not, they're not coming through faith, through the cross. They're coming through works, through the law. That, that, so, so, so there, so, we're talking about Orthodox, right? Not, well, not a, a, a pagan modern Jew. Well, so think about this with, with me this way. So look at Romans 10, verse 12. And if, if we ask the question this way, so if I were to ask the question, what does a person who is a Gentile today need to do to be saved? That's question one. And then question two would be, what does a person who is a Jew today need to be saved that's question two. And then question three, is there a difference between those two answers? And, and there is not a difference between those two answers. Let me show you why that is. So Romans 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Look at me at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And by the way, the term gospel of Christ is a Pauline term. You don't see that, that term used anywhere else in the scriptures other than in Paul's writings. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Now notice this. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So is there a difference today in how the gospel of Christ functions with regard to Jew and Greek? No. No, it's the same, right? No difference between them. Now, um, just to state the obvious, if you think about time past, so in time past, was there a difference between Israel and Gentiles? And the answer is there was, because Israel was God's chosen people. Gentiles were not. Ephesians 2.11 describes Gentiles in time past as aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and without hope in the world, because they were separated from Israel. Now, if we... Let's go back to... Uh, let's go back to our other chart. So... We know that in time past, there's a difference between Israel and Gentiles. But in the dispensation of grace, what has happened? Well, with the fall and diminishing of Israel, God has concluded them all in unbelief. So today, Romans 10, 12, is there a difference between Jew and Gentile and how they get saved? And the answer is no, it's the same thing. Okay. So let, let me repeat the question. So today everyone comes to faith the same way, but is there a believing Israel today? Was the question. So believing Israel in times past, or believing Israel after the cross followed Peter and the twelve. So if you think about before the cross, Luke 12 refers, Luke 12, 32 refers to the little flock. It refers to the little flock as the righteous nation within Israel. So if you think immediately before the cross, is most of Israel in belief or unbelief? Unbelief. unbelief. And the leaders of Israel are clearly in unbelief, right? But when the Lord refers to the little flock, what he's saying is within the nation of Israel large, the political ethnic group, 
there is a remnant, a little flock of believers at that time. When you go into the book of Acts, does God add to that little flock? Yes. He does. Because Acts 2, how many were added to the little flock in Acts 2? 3,000, right? 3,000 souls were added to them that day. Can, is Acts 2 the body of Christ? No. It can't be. For what reason? Paul hadn't been saved yet, right? So Acts 2 is plainly still kingdom church, plainly little flock. When 3,000 people are added to the church that day, they must be added to the little flock. They are the believing Israel. Yeah, they are the believing Israel, right? In other, well, think about it this way. If you're in Acts 2 and you didn't believe the kingdom gospel, you're not believing Israel, right? Because God's message to the world at that time is the gospel of the kingdom. And if you reject that gospel, you're not believing. So that group exists. So what I think you're asking as a question is, is there a believing Israelite nation or something like that today? Well, there's not because what happens is there's only one thing you can be in today, and that is the body of Christ. If you believe the gospel of Christ, what happens to you that moment? You're spiritually baptized into the body of Christ, right? And that's the thing to be in. There's nothing you can do beyond that. He's asking, can the a little flock or the remnant coexist throughout the dispensation of grace? Believe what they believe in that act. Can so, so the the question there is, in the in the in the early part of the book of Acts, before Acts nine, there's only the little flock. In Acts 7, with the stoning of Stephen, Israel begins its fall and diminishing, right? So if we look at the chart, we can see there where Stephen is stoned, and what happens immediately after that? The fall of Israel, the diminishing of Israel. Does the little flock continue to exist during the book of Acts? Yes, because when you read Acts 21, when Paul goes to Jerusalem... What, what is said to him by the leaders of the kingdom churches, you see how many thousands of Jews there are, and they're all zealous of the law. So there were people added to the kingdom church during the book of Acts. Who is the first member of the body of Christ? Paul. Very good. Paul's the first member of the body of Christ. So when does the body of Christ begin? With Paul. With Paul in Acts 9, right? So is there a time period in the book of Acts where both the body of Christ and the kingdom church are in existence at the same time? Yes, there is. Well, did the little flock live on until today? No, because what happened is, with the close of the book of Acts, the transition away from the kingdom program was complete. If you believe today, you're placed into the body of Christ. There is no little flock today. There is no... A righteous nation of Israel today. Anyone that believes is placed into the body of Christ. So the term Messianic Jew is meaningless? So the question is, is the term Messianic Jew meaningless? The, the term Messianic Jew is not a, a Bible term. Um, the term Messianic Jew, in, in my experience, refers to a Jew that then recognizes Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So what happens is if you are a Jew that recognizes Jesus Christ as the Messiah, in other words, recognizes him as the Son of God, if you do that and you believe the gospel of Christ, guess what you are? You're a member of the body of Christ, right? Right? Anyone that recognizes Jesus Christ as the Messiah, what does the word Messiah mean? The word Messiah means Christ. The word Christ means Son of God. So anyone that recognizes Jesus Christ as the Messiah, in other words, they recognize Him as the Son of God, if they do that and believe the gospel of Christ, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, if they believe that information, they are placed into the body of Christ. Okay? What if that, okay, so that happens, but what if they don't understand the 
dispensation of grace as given to Paul, they just believe that Christ was the Messiah and that he died on the cross. And they've trusted him for their salvation. So the question is, what happens if someone is a Messianic Jew, so they believe that Jesus is the Christ, and they trust the fact that he died for their sins, but they do not understand Paul's revelation. So what happens to that person? Well, they're just like almost every other member of the body of Christ. Yes. What is the largest denomination in the scriptures? The largest denomination in the scriptures is the ignorant brethren. In other words, so, and, and the best way to search this, we won't do this, but if you pull up Blue Letter Bible and you type I-G-N-O-R, and what's the next thing you should type? A-N-T. <laughs> A-N-T, or you could type asterisk. Why would you type asterisk? Because it would capture both ignorant, ignorance, and so on. If you type I-G-N-O-R, asterisk, and then B E R T asterisk, it'll pull up every verse where Paul says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. And then he explains something that he wants them not to be ignorant of. Now, just think about this with me for a minute. When you think about God's will for your life, you know from 1 Timothy 2 that God's will is that all men be what? That's right. Be saved is the first thing. And what's the second thing? Come to the knowledge of the truth. Come to the knowledge of the truth. So an ignorant brethren is someone that has done the first item, but not the second item. How do you know they've done the first item? They're saved. Because they're a brethren, right? If they believe the gospel, then they're a brethren. They're a member of the body of Christ. But if they don't come to the knowledge of Paul's revelation, what are they? Ignorant. Ignorant. So, unfortunately, the vast, vast majority of the body of Christ is ignorant brethren. And so, what they need to do is they simply need to come to understand, they need to come to the knowledge of the truth, they need to come to understand Paul as their apostle, and then they will cease to be ignorant brethren, and then they'll be established brethren. Much better thing to be. So, all, all that's good. We have a question from the Internet Two questions. Sure. So in Acts twenty six twenty, was Paul referring to the gospel of the kingdom at that point in time when he's talking about that they should repent and turn to God and do works and repentance? So the question is in Acts twenty six twenty. Is Paul referring to the gospel of the kingdom? So I'm going to be to lead up to that question. I want to just read the verses before it. So let's just start in verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So what's being described in this verse is, what, what is this referring to? Paul's road to Damascus. Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. So this first occurs in what chapter? Acts 9, right? So what we're reading about in Acts 26 is it's a recounting of what took place in Acts 9, right? Verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Now just notice this before we move on. When the Lord first appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, he tells him that there's going to be multiple revelations, doesn't he? 
because he's going to be a minister and a witness both of what thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So he's telling them, you've seen some things already, but there's going to be future revelations that I'm going to give to you. That's an important thing to know. So did Paul get all of the revelation that he was given in Acts 9, or did he get some later? He got some later. Now, notice verse 17. Delivering thee from the people. Who's the people? Israel. Israel. And from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So verse 17 tells you what else began in Acts chapter 9. Paul's Gentile ministry was launched in Acts chapter 9, wasn't it? Unto whom now I send thee. So when the Lord first appears to Paul, he tells him that he's going to have a ministry to Gentiles. Now, does that sound different from what he gave to Peter? It's completely different from what was given to Peter. All right, so let's keep reading. <clears throat> to open their eyes. Who's the there in verse 18? Gentiles. It's Gentiles, right? And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So what I want you to notice before we move on is in Acts 9, when the Lord appears to Paul, he already tells him at that time that he has a Gentile ministry and he is sent unto the Gentiles. And in fact, just to quote it, verse 17, unto whom from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So the sending to the Gentiles occurs right there. Now notice verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He's referring to what he saw in Acts chapter 9. So now we've got verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles. So he deals first with the Jews that are in, in, the, in that area, doesn't he? And then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now the question is in verse 20, is what Paul is preaching there the kingdom gospel? What verse tells you that Paul never preached the kingdom gospel? Do, 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 do. So look with me at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. I think we should do that. We should have some laughs together. It won't hurt. So look at 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ, what's the next word? Sent. Sent. Isn't that the exact word that's used in Acts 26? Unto whom now I send thee. So the sending to the Gentiles occurred in Acts chapter 9. Yes or no? Yes. yes. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, for Christ sent. When did Christ send Paul? Acts chapter 9. Right? The cross references directly tie. For Christ sent me, and then what does it say? Not to, baptize. not to baptize. Well, what was required under the gospel of the kingdom? Baptize. Baptism. So if Paul was sent in Acts 9, which he was, and he was sent not to baptize, how much of the kingdom gospel did he preach? None. Right? Now, what Paul did preach is we know he preached the gospel of Christ because we already read Romans 1.16 that told us that. And Romans 1 verses 1 to 4 tell us that Paul preached the gospel of God, which was that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So that's the content of what Paul preached. Paul never preached to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. 
That was not the message. So that deals with question number one, Stephanie. What would, what's the next question? Okay, so let's talk about this question. So when the two witnesses die, doesn't the world know the day and hour at that point? So here's the answer that I am going to give you. When you think about the 70th week, how long is a week in Daniel 9? Seven years. Will people know the exact day when the man of sin signs the covenant with Israel. They will know that exact day, and my guess is there will be a massive public ceremony, right? And it'll be a huge announcement, and you can watch it on the news. So if that's the case, then can't you just take that date, fast forward seven years, and that's the answer? Well, what must be the case is that the Lord doesn't return on the precise seventh anniversary of it, or you would obviously know the day. He's going to be there approximately seven years later, but you won't know the exact day. Now I'm going to ask you a question, so think about it and tell me the answer. What is going to take place that might make it difficult to know the exact day and hour of the second coming. There's something that happens that's going to make it very difficult to account for time. What is that? The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. So look at me at Matthew 24. Now, while you're turning to Matthew 24, let me make this point. How long was the ark preparing? 120 years, right? So, just think about this with me for a moment. When God is getting ready to flood the earth, 2 Peter describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And so what Noah does is he, is he preaches to the earth, the flood's coming. Save yourself from the flood, right? And, and what everyone on earth should have done is they should have said, okay, Noah, could you build an extra room in the ark because I'm coming with you. And, and Noah does that for 120 years. So the advance notice is plenty, Right? And people watch it and they scoff, 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 right? And you know there's people at 119 years and 10 months that are just mocking Noah, right? Noah, you've been saying this for more than 100 years. You've been wrong for more than 100 years. This is a joke. There is no flood. And they mock him, mock him, mock him. You know that's what happens. And every time they mock him, their buddy says, yeah, you're right. I agree. And they say that, say that, say that. And they, in their own minds, are fully convinced. And then it's too late. Right? Right? Noah gets in, shuts the door, rain starts to fall, and that's it. You can knock all you want. It won't do any good. My, my point is this. When you think of the flood, the flood is not a sudden event in the sense that no one saw it coming. For 120 years, Noah warns people that it's going to happen. It's sudden at the end. Do you follow what I'm saying there? Noah doesn't give like a four-minute warning and say, hey, guys, it's happening in four minutes. Well, the same thing is true with the second coming because the second coming has been prophesied for more than 2,000 years. Actually, quite a bit more, right? Because the Old Testament talks about it. So the second coming should be a surprise for no one, right? 
But what will happen is, just as immediately before the flood there were scoffers, 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 during the 70th week there's going to be scoffers, 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 and then suddenly, and it's, it's now too late. So look with me at Matthew 24, and let's just look at this. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So what happens is the tribulation concludes, is actually what verse 29 says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, here's what happens. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So what seems to happen there is the tribulation concludes, and you know what's going to happen. Are there people that are going to scoff at that? Oh, the tribulation's over. They said the second coming's going to happen. Guess who's not here? It's all baloney. It's all propaganda. None of it is true. They're just lying to you. You believe these crazy fundamentalist Bible thumpers. We're here and it hasn't happened. But then what happens immediately after the tribulation of those days, what happens to basically the cosmos? How do you reckon time on the earth? The basic way is through the sun and the moon, isn't it? So what happens if the sun is darkened and the moon stops giving her light? Will it be difficult to know the day or the hour? Now this is, this is what's fat. So watch this. Let's read it one more time. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. So that's going to create its own time and confusion of its own. And the moon shall not give her light. Well, it's going to be awfully dark in the universe. And the stars shall fall from heaven. So you won't even have starlight. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So it's going to be very dark, obviously. Now, this is just my opinion. You can decide for yourself. I think it's a fascinating thing to consider Operation Desert Storm, where what the United States specifically did for right or wrong in the invasion of Iraq is the first thing that they did was to destroy all electronic radar and intelligence. So the, the Iraqis possessed radar and other electronic systems to detect planes. And the U.S. was going to fly planes in, so they decided, we're going to destroy all their electronic infrastructure. The next thing they did is they flew the planes at night. So they're coming in in the dark. Well, if you have no electronic surveillance and the planes fly in the dark, you, you can't even see them. I don't know if you remember this or not. There was all this footage at the time of anti-aircraft cannons just shooting blindly up into the air because they were not radar-guided. They knew the planes were there because things kept blowing up, but they didn't know where the planes were, so they're just shooting. It's like literally shooting in the sky hoping to hit a bird. Obviously, that was unsuccessful. Well, what does God do at the second coming? Imagine if someone intends you harm. That person can see in the dark, you can't, and they just go over and turn off the lights. And now they're going to advance upon you. Terror. I mean, what, you, 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 defenseless doesn't even do it justice. So what happens in, in, in Matthew 24, 29, is the Lord effectively turns off the light for the world. Now notice verse 30. So it's dark. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So you first have pitch blackness. Now you have a sign. It's him. He's coming. You're going to deny that it's him? It's going to be transparent. It's going to be just more than evident. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mock. It's not what it says. Mourn. See, it's too late for the games. Listen, there are no atheists at the great white throne judgment, are there? At the great white throne judgment, when the universe has essentially been disintegrated and and, and guilty sinners stand before a holy God. Is there anyone that says, well, God, you don't exist. This court isn't real. This is all just your truth. My truth is different. Sorus, all of that garbage, 
you, you're just not, I mean, you, it, it's too impossible to even say. It's too absurd, right? Well, that's what happens right there. All the tribes of the earth, what do they do? You can't pretend it's not about to happen. He just turned off all the lights. Here's the sign. He's coming. What are you going to do about it? There's, there's nothing to do but mourn. What Revelation 6 says is that people cry out for rocks to fall on them. In other words, there's the Lord. He's coming in wrath. It would be... ...going on there. So verse 30, and then, shall appear, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that's, that's the second coming, and he returns to earth. So the, the short answer as to why you cannot know the day or hour is, first, it doesn't seem that the second coming is exactly seven years from the signing of the covenant, or else you could clearly know. That's the first reason you can't know. The second reason is, does God do some things to the universe that will make accounting for time difficult? He does. So that's the answer to the, the online question. What's that? Let's do another. So the gap between the rapture and the start of the 70th week, if we are rapture, won't the people then know that the second coming is soon? And will there be a surprise? So the question is regarding the, the gap between the rapture and the 70th week, won't the people know that the second coming is soon? So here's the, the answer to that. Is there a gap between the rapture and the start of the 70th week? So in other words, if the rapture happens on Tuesday, does the signing of the covenant by the man of sin, does that occur on Wednesday? The, now, you'll have different points of view on that. My answer to that is that the answer is no. And the reason why the answer is no, this is your homework. Read Daniel chapter 11. And when you read Daniel chapter 11, it's clear that there are some events that go on between the king of the north and the king of the south before the signing of the covenant of the 70th week between the man of sin and Israel. In other words, there is prophecy yet to be fulfilled that occurs before the start of the 70th week. So when the rapture happens, well, in other words, think of it this way. If, if you're in the fourth quarter and there's seven minutes and 32 seconds left and you call timeout, when the timeout is over, how much time is left on the game clock, seven minutes and 32 seconds. So the exact point in the prophetic calendar that things were when the dispensation of grace put a halt to the prophetic calendar, that's exactly where you will pick up after the rapture. So my point is this. If you think about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and it says the man of sin be revealed, well, the man of sin has to be revealed before he signs the covenant. He has to be revealed. He has to acquire political power. He has to be in a position to sign the covenant with Israel. So those events take place before the 70th week occurs, meaning after the rapture, there is a period of time. I, I've sometimes called this, others have a prophetic gap. It's a period of time with some events in Daniel 11 that take place before the signing of the covenant and the start of 70th week. Now, the, the other part of the question that was asked is, well, if people know that, don't they know the second coming is soon? And the answer is, they should know that. But they should know that. Forget the rapture for a minute. 
They should know that simply by the signing of the covenant of the 70th week, right? In other words, think of it this way. If, you're, if you are on the earth after the rapture, when the man of sin signs a covenant with Israel for one week, what should you do? Do you know he's the bad guy? See, what's going to happen is Revelation 13 says the whole world wondered after the beast. So what's going to happen is the beast is going to sign the covenant with Israel and everyone's going to say, yay, this is so great. Finally, we have a great, wonderful, charismatic leader, and he's so awesome, and he's going to defend Israel from those that wish to do him harm, and hallelujah. That's what the world's going to say. Now, what should happen is anyone with a lick of sense that believes Matthew 24 and Daniel 9 and Revelation, when he signs that covenant, no matter how charismatic and good-looking and whatever he is, Anyone with a brain should say, I know who this is. And it doesn't matter how well he speaks. doesn't matter how well liked he is. He's the guy, right? I mean, think about it. How could it be more clear? The prince of the covenant signs the covenant with Israel. Whoever signs it, he's the guy. It's simple as can be. And even though it's simple as can be, what happens? Yeah, the world wonders after the beast. This guy is so great. He is so fantastic. Now, I've, I've told you this before, but let me just say it again. This happened several years ago. A journalist was interviewing a rabbi in Israel. And the journalist asked the following, I think, very perceptive question. He asked the rabbi and said, the most zealous supporters of Israel in the United States are evangelical Christians. That's a true statement. And yet, the most zealous supporters of Israel in the United States think Israel is fundamentally wrong about the Messiah. Both those statements are true, right? In other words, the, the demographic that is most pro-Israel in the United States is evangelical Christians. And, he, and yet, even though evangelical Christians have that support of Israel that's very strong, they think Israel is fundamentally wrong about the identity of the Messiah because they missed him the first time. So the journalist asked the rabbi, how do you feel about that? Because your biggest supporters think you're fundamentally wrong. It's actually an interesting question. The rabbi responded and said, no worries. When the Messiah shows up, we'll just ask him, are you coming the first time or the second? So no worries, no big deal. What's the flaw in that thinking? Who's the first compelling messianic figure that's going to show up next in the prophetic program? It's going to be the man of sin. And so you go ask him the question, what's he say? Oh, I've never been here before. This is my first time. Right? When you read about 1 John... What's the very first word of 1 John? That. Check it out. See if that's true. Now, what's the normal way a New Testament book begins? How do all of Paul's letters begin? Paul. How do all of Peter's letters begin? Simon Peter. What are you doing beginning a book with that? Here's what 1 John says. That which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which our hands have handled of the word of life. And then he says in, in, in chapter 2, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. What's the whole point of 1 John? The whole point of 1 John is the fundamental doctrinal question during the 70th week is simply this. Did Jesus Christ already come in the flesh or not. If you believe he already came in the flesh, then you believe that the true Christ is who? Jesus of Nazareth. If you don't believe he already came in the flesh, guess who you're going to end up worshiping? The beast. 
So that's what's, that's what's going on there during the 70th week. Stephanie, were any other, uh, any other online questions? Okay. Very good. Anyone else have a question here? A real quick one. Yes, sir. Uh, Sunday you uh, <clears throat> spoke uh, in, about Matthew 15 and the Gentile woman approaching Jesus uh, to heal of her daughter. And uh, he, as you explained, did not address her directly because she was a Gentile and he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But in the end, he does uh, heal her daughter because she uh, has faith and she expresses to him who he is. Did she at that time become a Jewish proselyte? So the question is, did the woman in Matthew 15 that says, truth, Lord, uh, did, did she become a Gentile proselyte? So let's look at Matthew 15. So Matthew 15, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, she, she has some understanding, doesn't she? She knows he's the son of David, and she acknowledges him as Lord. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we know at that time that there is a distinction between Israel and Gentiles, right? And then Ephesians 2 describes the middle wall of partition that's between them. The Lord says, I'm, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. So if you follow the Lord's metaphor there with that, then what he's saying is that the difference between Israel and Gentiles is Israel is the children, and the Gentiles are essentially dogs. And you don't take the, the food that's meant for the children and give it to the dogs. Verse 27, And she said, Truth, Lord, Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now what she says there, I, 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 I don't, I'll, I'll give you this as a thought and you can decide what to do with it. She doesn't say that she's a member of the nation Israel. Does she? She says she's a dog. But she's saying that as a dog she can be blessed through Israel. That in other words the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. It's very similar to Genesis 12.3 where, where what God says to Abram is that in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And so what the Gentile woman here is doing is she's acknowledging, I'm a Gentile, but I can eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. So she had faith to understand how God was operating at that time and took her her place as a Gentile dog in, rela in relation to Israel. That, that's what appears to be going on there. Do you have a question? I have a, a quick question. Why is not more emphasis given going into the kingdom that they'd be healed? We all know that <coughs> baptism is <coughs> healing is very seldom spoken of. And that was a necessity, right? Yes, so look with me at Matthew 9. The question is, why is not more said about healing? Because healing was a necessity to enter into the kingdom. So, the, um, let, let me just pause for a minute and, 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 and lay some, some foundation. When you think about Exodus 19, verse 6, 
God's promise to Israel was to make them a kingdom of priests. And when you think about a priest in the Old Testament, there are a couple things that are true of them, but I'll just mention two. One of them is, is that for someone to serve as a priest, they have to be installed into the priesthood. There's a ceremony they go through where they're washed with water. The second thing that's true of a priest is that for someone to serve in the priesthood, they have to be a perfect physical specimen. If, if they have any sort of physical defects, what God provided in, in, under the Mosaic law was that they couldn't serve in that capacity. Now, what's absolutely fascinating is when you think about the gospel of the kingdom and the purpose of the, the purpose of the gospel of the kingdom, I think, is to form the kingdom of priests. There are two things that are, that are repeatedly connected with the gospel of the kingdom. The first one is water baptism, right? John the Baptist shows up preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and what is he known for? Baptism, obviously. Well, look with me at Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what did he do when he preached the gospel of the kingdom? And healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So was, did the Lord have a healing ministry? And the answer is he did. So what happens today is some folks cling to water baptism as a ceremony. Some folks cling to healing and signs and wonders. And they see those things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They existed at that time, but they existed as part of the kingdom gospel, and they are not something that was given to Paul during the dispensation of grace. So that, that's the way to think about that. Any other questions that anyone has? Okay, let's go ahead and then we'll do that one online. So the question is that Paul has a ministry to provoke Israel to jealousy, and how exactly does that work? The, um, so I'll, I'll answer that briefly by, by saying this. So what happens with Israel, it, when you think about Israel in time past, Israel is God's chosen people. And there are certain blessings that apply to them. And yet, they want to be like the world, don't they? So like one, for instance, is that they look at the Gentile nations around them, and they say, well, these Gentile nations have a king. You know what we need? We need a king. Well, that's the last thing they should have said, right? They should not have done that. Asking for a king made their life worse. But they wanted to be like the nations around them. And of course, they, they got into Baal worship like the nations around them and so on. There's this, you know, there's a sad reality of human nature is you don't know what you have until it's gone, right? And so Israel has this direct relationship with God in the Old Testament. They have a superior position to that of Gentiles. But what happens in the book of Acts? Well, when Israel falls and diminishes, what do they then also see? Well, let me, let me give you this for instance. When you think of the gift of tongues, what Pauline church is it most associated with? Corinth. You only really see Paul talk about tongues extensively in Corinthians. What was the unique feature of the meeting place of the church at Corinth. Look at Acts 18. Acts 18. So look at verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. 
Now, what, what do you, well, let's just keep reading here. Verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. Verse 6, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now, what Paul did in Acts 18 in Corinth is the same thing he did in Acts 17 in Thessalonica, which is when Paul would go into a city, where is the first place that he would go? Synagogue. synagogue. And when we, we read in Romans 1.16 about the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ is to the Jew first. The reason why the gospel of Christ was to the Jew first is after a couple thousand years of God dealing exclusively with Israel, before he can go to the Gentiles, he at least has to go to his people and say, hey guys, I need to tell you that there's been a change. There's been a change in plans. So that's what Paul's practice is. So in Acts 18, Paul's in Corinth. He goes into the synagogue. Verse 6, they opposed themselves and blasphemed. Verse 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now that last phrase is absolutely fascinating. Where is Justice's house in relation to the synagogue? It's on the other side of the wall. Now, what does 1 Corinthians tell you about tongues? That's true. Tongue ceased. Think with me of 1 Corinthians 1 22 and 1 Corinthians 14 22. For the Jews require a, a sign. That's 1 Corinthians 1 22. And 1 Corinthians 14 22, tongues are a sign for unbelievers. So if we put those two together, tongues must therefore be a sign to unbelieving Jews. So the church at Corinth, more so than the church at Thessalonica, more so than the church at Philippi, more so than the church at Ephesus, had the gift of tongues for what reason? Who was on the other side of the wall? Unbelieving Jews. Isn't that right? Paul goes to the synagogue first. He witnesses to them, and what did they do? They opposed and blasphemed. So he departed and he went how far away? Next door. So when the church at Corinth meets and they speak in tongues, what is it a witness of and to whom? So, so back to the original question, how does God provoke them? Well, their signs are given. Can you believe it? These signs are given to Gentiles? What is God doing? Those dirty, filthy Gentiles have been given the signs that belong to us. And so that, that's an aspect, I think, of the provoking ministry. Israel should see that. Now, what should happen? Let's be clear on this. When that happens, so by the way, think of Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes unto the Gentiles, what does he witness them do? Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. And when he hears them speak in tongues, he knows that the Holy Ghost has fallen on them. And he immediately says, can anyone forbid water baptism? And it's, it's like, he's like, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm going to water baptize these Gentiles. And this is crazy because just 20 verses ago, I said, it's unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or go into one of another nation. I shouldn't even be going to you guys. And now I'm going to baptize you? Well, what happened was he saw the Holy Spirit fall on them and speak in tongues. And he's like, well, obviously God approves of this, right? So that, that, that's what's going on there. Stephanie, you have a question. Yep. So the question is in Romans 118, what does it mean when it says that they hold the truth in unrighteousness? So we'll give a quick answer to this and conclude. So Romans 118, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
So I'll give you a short explanation of this. What people do all the time is they act and pretend the truth is unknowable. There are so many different Bible versions. Different churches teach different things. There's all kinds of different interpretations. Who knows what the truth is? Here's the key part. And therefore, I'm not accountable. I mean, look, if, if all the seminary trained preachers can't figure it out, if they can't agree, who am I to figure? How, how can I be responsible for figuring it out? And that's because the truth is so far away, so difficult to find, I'm not accountable for it. But what does Romans 1.18 say? Who do what? If you can hold it, it must not be that far. Right? So here's what, here's what happens. Here's the reality of truth. Truth is not distant from people. It's close. It's available. It's so close that you can hold it. And what happens when it says who hold the truth in unrighteousness, here's, here's the simple reality of it. Is there more than adequate evidence that there is a God? Yes. Is there more than adequate evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins and that He rose from the dead as a historical fact? There's plenty of evidence of all of that. And what happens is you don't really have an excuse for not believing it. I saw a video once with an atheist, and the question that was put to him was, a very famous atheist, the question that was put to him was, when you appear before God, what are you going to say if he says, well, why didn't you believe in me? And the atheist said, well, I'm just going to say, why did you make yourself so hard to find? I didn't believe in you because there wasn't enough evidence. How was I supposed to know? You were so veiled. It was so hard to figure out. But what's the truth of the matter? It's not that hard. The problem isn't that the truth is so hard to find. The problem is with men's hearts. And what do they do? They hold the truth in what? unrighteousness. They have a heart attitude that's unwilling to believe it. So we'll, we'll close with that. I do thank uh, the folks online for the questions. I thank the saints here for the questions. And uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll try to get to it next time. But let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we rejoice that you have given us this opportunity to fellowship together. We rejoice in your word and, and the truth that it has for us. Help us to study it. Help, help us to, to learn it, to believe it, and, and for our lives to be transformed by it. We give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.